came back and we want to go into ministry at the altars here yet. Uh, but I want to do this real quick. The sons of Ishakar, I've been meditating on this because of Daniel 2, verse uh, 21, 22. Daniel 2, verse 21, 22. I'm going to give you a few scriptures for your own kind of study. But I want to just point out a couple of things about the sons of Ishakar and a couple of key practical points that might help you discern and recognize your, your season. Like, am I in a winter season, spring season, fall season, summer season? Does God even speak in those terms, right? And how can we make the change in our season? As far as the decision you and me make intentionally can accelerate you and propel you into what's next. You could actually be ready for the season but miss the door because you don't know how to make the decision to propel yourself forward into what God has already opened. A lot of Christians stay stuck because they don't discern or know how to partner with what God is saying about the invitation into their next season. 40 days can be 40 years around the same mountain. How you respond to seasons, hardships, trials can determine 40 days or 40 years. So there is something about you and me in the process. There's something about divine time, Kairos time, Rhema time, such a time as this. But then there's this ability to discern and understand what the times and seasons are, the need for the seers. And the tribe that was the most you know, important tribe for seeing was what they called the tribe of the sons of Ishkar. One of the smallest, really. And, and there's a lot of things about understanding the history of the, the sons of Ishkar that kind of would make me go, I don't want to be of the tribe of the sons of Ishkar because they were ten, you know, slaves and worked for wages and the ones that kind of were on staff and worked for everybody else really hard, you know, it, it, that's kind of who they were. They worked for wages. They were like on hire. And they were burden bearers. There's a lot of things about the tribe of the sons of Ishkar that was not glorious. The, the picture of the whole idea of the tribe of the sons of Ishkar was of a donkey, an ass, couching down, crouching between two mountains, bearing burdens. That, that's the picture, the prophetic Hebrew picture of the sons of the tribes of Ishikar was the ones that would have to burden bear, work hard for hire, work hard for wages, and, and crouch down like a donkey, like an ass, and put their shoulder between two mountains. It wasn't glorious at all. They were called the burden bearers. And, and they were everybody else's servants and slaves. But yet they could see and understood times and seasons and knew what Israel was to do, when they should do it, and how to do it. They knew the plans. And they were called seers. They were a tribe of seers. And if you didn't know this, quite often when you talk about Ishakar, you have to talk about Zebulun and Judah. Because the way that God had the camps and the tribes, they, they would tend to camp out together. And, and one of the tribes you see moving with Ishakar was Judah first, behind the cloud. So the idea that when Israel went to war or were in the wilderness and the cloud by day, fire by night, after the cloud of glory was always Judah first. After Judah, you would see the, the Ishakar and you would see the Zebulun. And there's reasons it's Judah, Zebulun, and Ishakar. And when they would camp, they would camp out according to these different tribes. And it was always a connection there with Zebulun and, and Judah and the sons of Ishakar. And of course, Judah means praise, but in, in many ways, we've misinterpreted the meaning of Judah. Praise first, Judah first. It's not because it's praise, because really the word Judah means to be praised. So the idea of Judah and the lion of the tribe of Judah is not so much about because they went out as singers and worship, that's where the breakthrough comes, praise. It's a wrong interpretation. Judah means warlike, the character and the nature of the one that's the lion. Bold, without fear, courageous. It, it's so much more about the character and the nature of the one that's the lion that goes out to get its prey. That's why Judah first. The word interpreted is not praise because they're just praisers. Not that there's not breakthrough in praise, but you need to understand Judah in, in its anointing. When you hear about the sons, the anointing of the tribe of Judah, the word means to be praised. They were praised because they were like lions. That would go out and get its prey. So it's a much more predatory. Like I'm going to hunt like the lioness. And I'm bold and I'm courageous. The, the traits of the nature of God revealed in the lion. The lion of the tribe. So it goes beyond singing and music and instruments. 
We've always interpreted it as praise. But it literally means the triumph that comes from praise. It's a warfare term. So it's much more than just singing. And after that, you'd see this Issachar and then Zebulun. Let me say this about Zebulun. I don't have time to preach. Zebulun is the tribe of wealth and money. Resource, wealth, and money is with the Neb- uh, Zebulun. And the tribes of Issachar, if we get into the whole thing, came from those you know, tribes with Jacob, with Leah, and then the 12 blessings spoken over the, the 12 sons of Jacob. When the blessing was spoken over Issachar, I'm just going to share a couple of things here uh, about the anointing uh, that's important for you to understand the seer activation you're going to get today. Because God's highlighting 1 Chronicles 12.32. 1 Chronicles 12.32, just one of the scriptures here uh, that many of us know about from Issachar, men who understood times and knew what Israel should do. Not only did they understand times and seasons, they knew what we should do. The blueprint, the pattern, what to do. So you've got unfulfilled kingdom visions and dreams. You don't just need more uh, understanding of those. You need to know what to do. What to do in your life, in your ministry, in your business. What to do. So that's part of the anointing of the sons of Ishakar that we're going to release today is so that you know what to do. How many of you know that a lot of your unfulfilled kingdom visions and dreams, what to do? So I can make the shift and make the transition. So the sons of Ishakar were men who understood the times. They had knowledge of what Israel should do. They had foresight. They understood exactly what time it was. It was time for David to take the throne. Usually it's a governmental thing. The sons of Ishakar tend to establish uh, the governmental uh, anointing. Even if that's going to be with kings or or, or people in in government, in marketplace. They knew that it was time for David to take the throne. And it was time to establish the kingdom of God. So the tribe of Ishakar, this tribe, understood the time. And they could even interpret the word of God in the proper time. They were connected to Zebulun, the wealth tribe, because provision for the journey and the supply for the victory were important. So God took quite often the seers and connected them with wealth and resource and money. God would take the gift, seers, and connect them with those that had resource and wealth and money, Zebulun. And they would connect in with Judah because they were the first behind the cloud. And you've got to have the atmosphere, the cloud, the glory, the praise, so that you can be a seer. But then the seer's got to be connected into the money, the resource, and the wealth. So how many are ready for the impartation of the, the seer, but it's a releasing and a prophetic promise of, of the wealth that's connected into the provision for the victory, hand in hand. Because what's good, you know, seers, and they... Dreams and visions, revelation and dreams and vision, we, strategies, and we know what the enemy and... But you don't have any provision. So many of the seers, like Levites, their inheritance was just a 10% of everything that everybody else had. Well, the Issachar, they were the ones that had to work for wages. They were like the servants. They were like the slaves in which you could go and get revelation and understanding. And they could you know, really tell you, you know, time, seasons. But yet they weren't financially as blessed as all the other tribes. How many of you know how valuable seers are? So just kind of giving you some of this stuff quickly. I just don't have enough time to preach the whole thing the way I'd like to. But most Christians don't know that God has his own calendar. God's timetable is clearly revealed in the Bible. The calendar was followed by Jews in the Old Testament, Jesus, apostles in the New Testament, the early church, hundreds of years, even during the Dark Ages. The church turned from God's calendar and adapted a pagan Roman calendar in which we do things today based on American time. Holidays, times, seasons, we tend to move by when it's Christmas or, you know, we have a whole different clock in which the Hebrew clock. God's got his own time. And I think the way that he had it for Israel is a better time. Not that we're going back to some old systems or law or covenant, but just the spirit of what I'm saying, God still has ordained times and seasons. In Acts 3.21, times of refreshing. That means there are specific God-ordained times of visitation. You know, Israel wept because Jerusalem did not know their hour of visitation. And Ephesians 5, redeeming the time. 
Because the days are evil. God can even redeem time, make the sun stand still. You know, there's all kinds of references to kairos or divine times or rhema times for such a time as this. God does things by times. And, and there's things about God's sovereign time in the end. You know, I don't know how it all plays out for you in your end time biblical eschatology, but God has an end yeah. in which there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And I don't spend a lot of time trying to understand all the natural signs, yeah. times, antichrist signs, and media signs, and newspaper signs. I don't spend a lot of time uh, on, the, on the signs that, that we tend to look to in Revelation or try to make it all right in our theological end time eschatology box. But prophetically, I really do appreciate the, the times in which God gives me the dreams and the visions and the revival harvest mandate and the 10 and the double 10 and the 818 and things that just make it real for me in my own dream language, in my own spiritual language, in which God has saved me time and time again by personal prophetic dreams and revelation because I've been able to see and I've been able to see in darkness at times. I've been able to see in darkness. The plans and strategies of the enemy. And I've been able to turn warnings and things that could have been potential destruction, disaster. I've been able to overcome things about the way the enemy was wanting to bring assignments to destroy churches and ministries. And, you know, we get to see in darkness too. It's not just in the glory. We need to say, God opened my eyes to see in the darkness. So we're talking about the tribes, right? The Ishakar anointing specifically because behind Judah first, the cloud is Ishakar. The Ishakar means there is a reward. Did you know the name Ishakar means you will have a reward? You will have a reward. It's literally what it means. But it also means wages, a payment, compensation. Ishakar, literally, like the seers in the Old Covenant. You would never go to the seer without a gift. Because the whole idea of the seer was wages and comp compensation. You were responsible when receiving revelation. To bring a gift to the seer. That's why in 1 Samuel 9, 6, Saul would not go to the seer to get a word until he had a gift. Right. It's biblically right to the root meaning of the word seer. We don't do a lot to support our worship. We don't do a lot to support our seers. Right. But many of the other things we spend or give our money to. But yet, it's probably the worship, the Levites, and the Ishakar, they're probably two of the most valuable and that's why God put with Judah and Ishakar, the third tribe was Zebulun. The tribe called wealth, money, and supply. That's what Zebulun is. And so you have Judah first, then you had Ishakar behind the cloud of glory, Judah first, praise. Then you had the seers in the atmosphere of the glory, praise, the seers. And then you had the money. How many of you are ready to see the supply and the money come with your gift? Because God's about to honor the seers. You hear what I'm saying? God's about to elevate the prophetic. Oh, I don't have time to get into the whole thing, but hallelujah. What are the other references in Genesis 14, verse 15? Genesis 49, sorry. Genesis 49, 14 and 15, if you want to write it down. It's another great reference to the tribes of Ishakar. Genesis 49, 14 and 15. Ishakar is a strong donkey laying down between the sheepfolds. Uh, so literally, when you saw that a resting place was good and that the land was pleasant, the, 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 the donkey bowed down his shoulder to bear all the burdens and become a slave to a forced labor. A slave of forced labor. That's the tribe of the sons of Ishakar, seers. They're burden bearers. Because sometimes when you're a seer and you're, and you're understanding times, seasons, visions, you also have to be prepared to get in the trenches and to work it out. To work out that unfulfilled dream and vision. And sometimes it is a burden to bear when you're a seer. Some of what you're being trusted to see and share. But then the responsibility that you have to bear... The weight and the burden. So there's all kinds of things I could say about that. You know, the, the prophecy about the tribe of Ishakar, their name means he will bring a reward or man of wages. He will bring a reward or the man of wages, but it also means strong. He will be strong. But you can read it yourself. And then again, Deuteronomy 33.18, uh, write this down. Deuteronomy 33.18 and 19, another reference. The Zebulun tribe. Rejoice Zebulun in the going out. Because Issachar. See how God always puts Issachar and Zebulun. Wealth, trade, money together with the Judah anointing and the Issachar anointing. Three anointings. 
He said, I'm going to put together with Zebulun, Issachar, and they will call the people to the mountain. And they will offer righteous sacrifices, for they will draw on the abundance of the sea, the wealth of the sea, and the hidden treasures of the sand will be released because of Zebulun and Issachar. You see, the hidden treasures of darkness, the secret riches of secret places, will not be uncovered without hidden insight to the secrets, to the mystery. This is why we need the Ishakar. But then God has the Zebulun. You want to get to the Zebulun, to the wealth, to the treasures, to the abundance? God uses the seer to unlock what, when, where, and how. Because they're an understander of the times and seasons. They could do it by stars, by astronomy, by dreams, by visions, by revelation. They just prophetically were in tune to timings. This anointing is going to get on people today that that want this anointing. Hallelujah. The tribe understood time, could interpret the word of God. They were connected to Zebulun. They were connected to the wealth tribe because provision for the journey and the supply for the victory were important. God wants us to understand and interpret our times so that we can prosper in every season and have wisdom to advance. Do you understand what's going to be released today? Not just praying for seers and the Ishakar anointing, an understanding of times and seasons. We're going to pray for the wealth and the supply and the abundance hand in hand with those that are called to be seers. But how about strategies from heaven so you can see the key to the breakthrough in your life, in your business, in your ministry? God gave me an idea in December 2017. He said, I'm going to increase you 1,000 times. And he gave me an idea that when I launched it, my money went up 1,000 times in eight weeks. We added 1,000 students to our mentoring. And we're seeing an increase, a thousand-fold increase that's happening. It's going to, you know, this year. And we're launching stadiums. So there's a whole new financial thing that comes with, well, I had a revelation from heaven. I get these ideas from heaven. And how do you know they're God? Well, when you take practical steps towards your vision, like you're testing it out, if the oil in favor follows, keep going. It's a sign. So people are like, oh, he's doing stadium launch in New York. And now they're seeing the favor on it. They're like, whoa, maybe he did hear God on that. And he's not doing an easy thing to fill a stadium in America. I mean, that's big work. Time, energy, money. And, and thousands are mobilizing. There seems to be an oil. That you've got to press on the door a little bit. And you know, it's okay to take risks and test out. It's something you believe God spoke to you or confirmed and you really believe it's a word from heaven. It's okay to take practical steps towards seeing that happen. Like in your business, get the, get the business license. Get the ministry charity going. You know, begin to take practical steps that you can that are easy without sudden drastic change of everything just to begin to see if the favor follows. Peace will be your fleece. That's a Doug Addison quote. Peace will be your fleece. As you move towards your vision. But many of you that just know God spoke to you about the Catherine Coleman are making no steps towards reality. You could go on a mission trip. It could be as practical as do that ministry school that's going to help launch you. It could be as practical as get the business license, get your, your charity set up. I mean, the things that you could do in the natural that show God you're serious about having the wine skin. So when he gives you the wine, he can trust you with it. I had all this vision about revival breakthrough, the winds of change, the angels that gather and taught at a dream about the winds of change, revival breakthrough and the harvest angels, you know, revival harvest. You know, the Lord said, well, book the stadium. I was like, book the stadium. He said, yeah, book the stadium. I'm going to give it to you. August 17th, 18th, 19th. You're going to do revival harvest America. Book the stadium. Stop talking about what's coming. 20 years ago, Bob Jones said. 30 years ago, Bob Jones, uh, Rick Joyner said. 30 years ago, Paul Cain prophesied. He goes, you've had the stadiums in Florida. Double, double. It's time for you to pick up that thing. Now, now stop talking about what's coming. Yeah, Billy Graham passed. Now, what are you doing to take intentional steps forward to do the harvest? I said, God, that means I'm in with my time, my people, my money, my energy. He said, exactly. That's how I know that you're serious about receiving what I'm about to pour out. Because you are taking intentional, practical steps towards your goal. And then watch the favor of God on it. God will never make it confirmed first with money in the bank first. You know, he'll always say, you're going to go to Pakistan? Yep. You're going to reach a million? Yep. It's going to cost how much? Yep. And you never have $1 towards the goal. And until you said it, until you get your name on the paper to go to the mission to Mexico, money will not follow. 
Do you see what I'm saying? Practical things about what you believe is your vision. Don't sit on it for another 20 years. There could be sovereign times, but there could be you taking steps and risks. Look for the peace of your fleece and look for the oil and the favor to follow. These are some practical things about how to know your time and season. How to know when you're transitioning right. You got to have keys, guys, that are going to help you. Listen, Deuteronomy twenty-seven twelve is another Ishakar anointing reference. Deuteronomy twenty-seven twelve, when you have crossed the Jordan, these tribes will stand on the mountain with Moses to bless the people. Ishakar. You see, the seer tribe was the one that God put up on the mountain to speak all the blessings over Israel. The seers. They're not just getting and seeing and discerning. They're speaking and releasing. The blessings. Speaking and releasing the blessings. Ishakar. There's so many other references, right? So let me give you a key to knowing your season. Because you got training seasons, preparation seasons, transition seasons, just to name a few. You know, one of my favorite promises when God talked to me about the changing of your season. You know, Song of Solomon 2, 10. Rise up, my love, my fair one. Come away with me. He said, that's your season. Into the king's chambers we go. Your secret history in God is made in the intimate chambers of the king. Rise up, my love, because your winter is past. It's spring. There's a blossoming. There's a flourishing. But come to the secret place of the stairs. That's Song of Solomon 2, 10 through 15. And there's times where the Lord calls you into extended seasons of encounter and visitation. I talked about the 90 day glory liquid honey cloud. The Lord told me on the spring this year. He said this is the season in which every revival in your life happens. And I started thinking back to every revival I've had between March and May. Mother's Day. Between March and May is every major revival I've ever had. Canada. East Texas glory revival. Mother's Day. Lakeland, Florida. The anniversary, 10 years, will be coming up in two weeks, April, April 3rd. I went to South Africa, April 3rd, Healing Awakening, South Africa. I went to Korea, uh, Move of God, Glory Liquid Honey Cloud, March 2018, Mother's Day Visitation, launched my ministry 20 years ago. Every major revival I've had that I could name broke out between March and May. It's my spiritual season of encounter and visitation. I really believe when the glory fell on me just a couple of days ago, 322, he said, we're coming into the beginning of spring. He goes, this is when I visited you 20 years ago. Are you going to press into it? Because you're on the threshold right now of of those that are hungry and you just kind of feel the restless, like God's going to come, a new season of visitation and glory, and he's going to prepare me for something. You know what happens after preparation, right? Esther made herself ready. After a season of preparation, comes Joshua 5, the commander of the army of the Lord. And he commissions you. Because many are called, but few are chosen. If you don't have the burning bush, the upper room, the Pentecost, and you know, if you don't have the Joshua, the commander of the army of the Lord, you can be called. Many are called. But until you're commissioned, and you know, extended times in his presence, preparation, is preparation for your new mission and mandate. Quite often, your mission and mandate is preceded by a season of encounter. In which God makes you ready. But if you've ever been in seasons of training, you've ever been in seasons of preparation, you've ever been in seasons of, 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 of birthing, and you always kind of feel like you're there. You're always birthing, waiting, transitioning, birthing, waiting, transitioning. Some of you need to know how to make the shift. Because <sighs> you're not, a 40 day journey's becoming 40 years because you didn't know how to shift in. You're still talking about, well, I'm getting ready, I'm training preparation i'm in transition you kind of feel stuck because some of you don't understand the permission principle the permission principle you got the permission to take intentional steps to move forward take risks peace will be your fleece see if the oil and the favor follows okay i can say a whole lot of things about that but you need to understand that quite often after every great season of the word of the lord came on to me i went to the king and said god puts you off like the prophet elijah by yourself at the brook cherith in total silence where the ravens are bringing you meat and you're drinking from the water 
the great prophet, you just went to the king, gave the biggest prophecy you've ever given. No dew or rain on the earth these years except at my word. You're in the presence of the king, telling Ahab. And now you're like at some brook, isolated, quiet. Where are you, God? Elijah was there often, wasn't he? After the Mount Carmel victory, he's in the cave, discouraged, disappointed, alone. God wasn't in the earthquakes or storms, the still small voice. Here's Elijah in the cave again, at the brook Sheriff again, by himself. After the greatest victories and prophetic words and platform and to the kings. You know what that's called in your process? It's this death in which we die again because you die to your ambitions. You die to your need to be needed. Until you die to your need to be needed. Until you die to your need to have platform and opportunity and ministry. Until your selfish ambitions die. God puts you alone at the brook. And all you got are the ravens, the meat, and the water. You're in silence. You're in isolation. Even the prophet Elijah. Twice in a place of silence. And isolation. And dying. Am I alone left? Are there no other prophets but me? That's the process in which every prophetic person especially... Even after I'm, I'm prophesying to kings, I'm on Mount Carmel calling the fire down, and, and I'm out in the Pakistan, I'm, I'm, you know, revivals and stadiums, and, you know, and then I'm alone and I'm isolated. I'm in this little apartment and nobody's talking and I'm, I'm bored. And then God begins to go, do you love me enough that you love me more than all that glory in public and ministry? Can you die to that? Because until you die to that, you can never really be ready. Until you can love Jesus enough for who Jesus is and not what he does through you in ministry. It's a hard thing for our team and culture and tribe because so much of what we preach is about getting out there in your ministry and get your gifts and anointings of man. And so much about what we do is commissioning people. But I have found myself in that wilderness, quiet, secret, isolated, down by the brook. What do you do when the brook runs dry? How does the great prophet Elijah end up in these processes again and again? Where he goes from saying to the king, access to bring a word to the king. And then he finds himself in the caves after Mount Carmel and brings the fire. And he's in the cave. I want to die. I'm disappointed. There's only me left. It's this cycle in which we, there's, there's really these things that happen before transition in your life. One, ministry doors seem to close. This is how you know you're about to go into transition. All your doors close. You find yourself isolated from ministry, friends, and family. Even your desire for ministry fades. But then you enter into a face-to-face encounter with God. Into an extended time in His presence and you have visitation. And God begins to prepare you again for the next mission and the next mandate. That comes out of the intimate place of His presence As your secret history in God is made in the chambers. And there's this continual. Doesn't matter how many years it is. That you do life and preach and ministry. Is you will find yourself again and again in seasons. Where it seems as if every door. Just kind of closes suddenly. Things begin to dry up. And you find yourself quiet. And withdrawn. Even in the midst of all your busyness. And you're like man I'm being called away again into a place of silence and isolation because I'm about to be prepared. I'm going through that process again of transition preparation because God's going to have me in this face-to-face season. The glory cloud's coming. And I'm going to make myself ready. But you know what comes after that? After the face-to-face? Is God sends you out again and you come back in, in power. And you come back with the clarity of the vision. You come back with the mission. It's like when Moses went up to the mountain for 40 days. He came back with the revelation. And you may be in the midst of the revelation. And God says, come back to the mountain. Talk. And pretty soon everything just seems to shut. And the favor just seems to go. And even your desire. You're just like, suddenly I'm tired and burned out. And, uh, what's wrong with me, God? It's because you've been resisting the call to rise up and come away. See, some of you that find yourself in a place of, you know, I'm bored and burned out. I have no desire. What's happening? It's because you've been resisting the beckoning of preparation. You're missing the season of the Lord trying to call you away so that he can make you ready like Esther. 
for the next season of favor because there's seasons and cycles of favor, missions, mandates, and assignments. And I may have things that God gave me 20 years ago, the glory, liquid, honey, cloud, but there's things that I need to get now in the extended times in his presence, whether that goes on for days, weeks, or months. There's a continuous cycle in which you will victory and die, victory, isolation, and die. You're at the brook by yourself because God is trying to bring you into the encounter in which will sustain you in power for mandate. Because you need a visitation from heaven, current. About 20 years ago. And some of you have resisted it. So the Lord stands and knocks, but you didn't. Well, I'm busy. I'm in bed. I've taken off my robe already, and he's at the door. But, you know, can you come back at a more convenient time, God? I'm busy in a relationship. I'm distracted. Listen, one of the number one tools of the enemy is distraction in your focus. Everything is about focus. And if the enemy gets you fed off on something sidelined, distracted, life, people, relationship, you fill your life up with stuff that, that you think is filling a void, but really it's, it's drawing you away from your ultimate call and destiny. It's a sacrifice sometimes to have to lay down things that you can even love and have because you know God's calling you to the greater mountain. Most of us resist that place because it's hard and lonely but it's face to face with Jesus. It's you in the king's chambers. How many of you are ready to put behind you the, the, the winter season? You're ready for the spring season. You're ready for the summer season. Summer's harvest, by the way. You're ready. It doesn't matter in the natural what time it is, but your spiritual season. Don't wander about that mountain for another 20 years or another 40 years because you didn't respond to the process in the way that you could when the trials came and the brokenness came and the pain came. Get it right. And if you're still dealing with the same old, it's because you didn't get the message. If you're feeling like all the doors are closed and you're feeling like all the favors drying up and you feel like all the ministry opportunities and you're feeling kind of like, what, what's happening? It means you're supposed to be in a season of encounter and seeking God. And all that will come back with new favor. But if you don't recognize that season, we've got to take steps towards His Word to see what happens. It's okay to seek confirmation. Agreement, two or more on a word. But sometimes you've got to go beyond seeking confirmation, you know, asking God, but really just beginning to take practical steps, intentional steps, building out the wine skin that you're going to need so you can say, hey, God, I'm serious about the wine because look at the structure I built. I've seen people as practical as got a business card, got a website, got a business license, got a 501, got their charity. I mean, they did all the legal stuff because they were so serious about God's going to send me. There's other people that just can't really grab a hold of what God wants to do through them because and they're, and they're, they're working so hard in, in the world, but you know you're called, but you're not willing to understand the business side. We call it the ministry business. We don't even like the word business and ministry. It offends them. But if we don't begin to understand that part of what we do in our call in ministry, there is a business. There's an apostolic. There's a structure side. Because I have partners, I do what I want. You just work another 20 years. It, but you could have done what you wanted, but you didn't want to build. Well, I just want to let the Lord, if it's Him, He'll provide. If it's Him, He'll heal me. If it's Him, He'll send me. If it, No, He won't. It doesn't happen like that. You have it in your nation to preach in, in the harvest in the stadiums. Book the stadium. Book the trip to Mexico. Do something, but change the ordinary. Find an intentional blueprint and patter and work and partner and if the favor's on it and don't worry about, well, what if it's not and I miss God? Go. Well, God can change the sudden drastic shit. You could be in one direction and the Spirit of God did not permit Paul. He said, well, I'm going to preach the gospel over there. The Spirit of God shut the door and then he had a dream and a Macedonian call and a vision and he said, I'm going to Macedonia. God reserves the right at any moment to to interrupt the business of your life and sovereignly he will so get out of the fear of what if I miss God and moving in a direction well if you're really trying
trusting and seeking and intimate with your father. He's more concerned about you accomplishing what he's called to than letting you continue down a road and path. He will bring a sudden direct intervention and interruption and he'll begin to say, nope. And you'll be like, well, I just need to make a sudden change. But if you don't adjust to the shift when it comes and you keep on going down that road and path, it ends in death and destruction. Just go ahead and do that relationship anyways. Go ahead and do that business anyways. Just go ahead and do that ministry anyway. You don't feel the oil in favor on it. Better back up and readjust. But this idea of being afraid that you're going to miss God. That's what's kept you not doing your unfulfilled vision and dream. Because you wouldn't get out of the boat. With a small step. Something. Ask God. He'll show you plans. The tribe of the sons of Issachar didn't just have an understanding of times and seasons. But what Israel should do. I know what to tell my staff to do. I know what to tell my ministry to do. I give vision. They wait for. I can problem solve. There's just things that I know what, when, where, and how. Direction that I know how to give. That God can give you when you're under the anointing of the sons of the tribes of Ishikar. You don't even have to have a business degree. You can have a grade 9 education and no GED. And you can run a multi-million dollar ministry. You know the favor of God's not fair either. I've got people calling me right now. Worldwide ministries. Recognize big movements calling me. How is it that you've had over a thousand people in your mentoring? How is it that your school is just exploding with all this interest? And I said, well, I got a plan from heaven in December. And God kind of gave me this idea. And I went to my staff about it. And they were like, well, you know. And now they're watching. And they're like, well, hey, maybe there's something in there. Now you want to do stadiums? The moment I said yes to New York, book the stadium, California said, hey, we have a stadium paid in full. Texas is mobilizing a stadium. Florida's going to mobilize the stadium. I was like, I'm now overnight the stadium guy. I'm getting invitations to stadiums. Overnight. Ten years is a timing thing. But I took risks. I took steps. I worked. And the oil and the favor is coming. And there's still work to do. But if you don't start moving towards a goal, you can talk about it. You know, Catherine Coleman anointing, don't even pray for the sick. I had this guy in my church for a long time back in Canada. He used to say, man, I've studied deliverance for 20 years. I've learned the best. Everything about casting out demons. I said, well, when are you going to do it? He goes, brother, don't push me. I've been getting ready. I'll do it when I'm ready. And I said, while you're getting ready, I cast one out yesterday. And I'm, go- I'm a brand new Christian, by the way, at this point. I'm like four years I was like, and you're like 55, and you've been through Bible school, Rama school, you, you've studied everybody on deliverance. He goes, brother, I'm a teacher, and I just, I know how it works. Let me tell you things about deliverance. And you want to tell me how to do what you've not done. Because you're waiting for this, I'm waiting for this sovereign day in which I'm going to be this deliverance ministry. And I could be greater than Lester Summerall and Derek Prince. I said, really? Uh, well, I'll just see you there. And I came back from a meeting in Africa, and I said, bro, his name was Don. I said, Don. Guess what happened in Africa? 1,835 witches and people under witchcraft went into mass deliverance in front of everybody. And 1,835 demons manifest. And we cast them all out on mass. And he grumbled off. (laughs) He had the theology with no experience because he was waiting for this. God's got to show me, brother. God's got to show me. God's got to show me. What a cop out. God doesn't show you to brush your teeth in the morning, what color your shirt to be. You just make decisions about your life, go on a vacation with your family whenever you want to. Listen, you want to do something for God? Plan it. It really is that simple. Heaven is not resisting more than you think. Oh, he doesn't want me to go on that mission. Just go. Get a passport and go. Well, what if it's not God? I'm supposed to go to Africa. You know, I've had words about it. Go. There's people taking teams every year to Africa. You're missing out. Well, I'm supposed to preach. Take steps. The gospel is a gospel of action, people. You're sitting on years of unfulfilled visions and dreams where the green light and the permission is there, but you've got no trust. You've got this sovereignty thing where it's all just going to kind of fall out and happen and somebody's going to pick you up and overnight you're going to have all this ministry. 
Todd Bookley's going to see it or Benny Hinn. And they're going to bring you on their show, launch you. And it doesn't happen. If it happens that way, let me say this. It's going to happen regardless of what you do or don't do. So in the meantime, do something. If seers could not find a way to be doers, understanding is one thing. I'm going to tell you about all your times and seasons. But now I'm going to show you what to do, what Israel should do. There's an actual practical application to the sons of Ishakar. That's why God said I'm going to put them with Zebulun. Because I'm going to connect them with wealth and money and resource. Because your vision and your dream, even what you see, has to be connected to money to be reality. Most seers I know aren't in the ministry they're called to be in because they're too busy working, paying bills, distracted. Because God's never connected you to Zebulun. How many of you are ready to receive today the threefold Judah, Ishakar, Zebulun, the anointings? Judah first, then Ishakar. Then I wish I had time to go through all my notes, guys. I was just touching the surface. I wrote this till four in the morning. I want to pray for everybody today that really wants to have this. Lord, let scales come off our eyes. I feel like there's been an attack on our, our vision. I talked about that Thursday night. Thursday night I was here and I talked about an attack on our vision. And I, I talked about the natural, the spiritual. More often than not, when somebody gets healed in the natural, like blindness, there's something in the spirit. Eyes to see, ears to hear, right? Deaf and dumb spirit. It's a spiritual, it's a natural. And so I came in here Thursday night and kind of got really real and transparent about my eyes, having to go to the doctor on Tuesday this week. And, and the doctor is testing my eyes Tuesday because they think I have a genetic inherited eye disease that I've never known, that I've never known I've had, that I've never known I've had. And I would have not even caught it if I didn't go in because I, I noticed my one eye wasn't seeing like my one eye. My one eye is twenty twenty. But I went in because I thought, man, my right eye in the last year has just kind of dropped quite a bit in vision. You know, simple. You know, maybe I need some reading glasses. I wasn't thinking much about it. So I was getting an eye exam, and um, the doctor said, man, we, we, you know, your eyes are great in the sense of you've got a twenty twenty, but this eye here has lost 30 40% of its vision. And I looked at your retina, and both your retinas are inflamed from the back. And it's not connected to any other condition or disease or diabetes or anything, you know. He said, you have a rare disease of your eyes that could end up in legal blindness or total blindness. And there's no cure for it. And I'm sitting there going, excuse me? I just came in for an eye exam. And you're now telling me that I have a condition that sometimes teenagers have. And they end up blind suddenly by the time they're 42, 43, 44. They just go blind because they have this rare disease uh, that can be an atrophy of the, the retina. Incurable. And I was like, you're telling me right now on Thursday. This just happened to me. And I knew I was having some issues with my eye. And driving at night was becoming more of a challenge. And so I kind of went in and thought, I'm going to be a good steward and, you know, watch my eyes and get my glasses maybe. And they said, sir, this seems to be a serious condition. So Tuesday, I've got to go to a retina specialist to see what disease I have, which I'm claiming will be gone and I don't have. So don't, don't, I'm just telling you the facts, but I'm not going to agree. And I'm going to have the Caleb anointing and be as strong at 85 as I am at 45. So... But the shock of that, I had to come into the release in the Sears tonight, and I thought, how can we even talk about God opened my eyes to see, and now I've got an attack on my vision in the natural. And, and of the most serious kind, like you could go blind. It's not even an eye problem, it's just I went overnight, I learned I could go blind. And I thought, what, what? He go, incurable. I, I, I said, well, i got the power of God, I'm just going to have to get healed then because I'm a healing evangelist. So I asked everybody, I asked everybody Thursday night to pray for me, continue to pray. That when I go Tuesday, there will be no eye condition. I don't care if it's a false diagnosis or whatever, I'll take anything. But, and, and I'm just contending and fighting all the way through. So don't, don't get the idea that I got fear or I'm going blind. Or, I don't care what the reports are. But the Lord said to me, the natural, he said, there's an attack on vision. You're a seer. 
And all vision isn't always Holy Ghost from dreams, visions from heaven. Listen, where my people have no vision, they perish. The attack is vision. Complacency, disappointment, discouragement, uh, waiting, not seeing, hope deferred. He said there's an attack on vision. People just don't have a lot of vision about who they are and what they're called to. He goes, so there's an attack on vision. And vision has become small. And I wrote down this. I wrote down big God, big stuff, big vision. I remember my vision was always bigger than my realities. I always had vision like casting. That never lined up with my current situation or circumstance. And people would always say to me, you go, there was 20 people in that meeting and you preached like it was 10,000. You know? I was 22 years old preaching for Patricia King. She said, you carry yourself like you are Benny Hinn or Reinhard Bonnke. And you know, you've been preaching for like a month and there's like 20 people. And you carry yourself as if you're projecting what you will be. And you're catching up to what you project. You hear, you hear what I'm saying? You're catching up and pulling what you will be into your future. You're catching. She goes, it's amazing how you, you give vision. Even when I was 22, apostolic, I could give vision. And then I catch up to the vision and it happens. And then I need a bigger vision. I need a bigger vision. Now listen to what I'm about to say to you. I'm bringing it to a close. God is only obligated to do exceedingly abundantly above what you can even ask, think, dream, or imagine. So when you dream with God, it's the whole dreaming with God thing. According to your faith, let it be done. If your vision is not able to see the capacity of potential, God is not obligated to do more than you believe or expect. He can only do above where you can see or dream. So I mean saying God give me a billion dollars isn't even real because your faith doesn't really believe as presumptuously as you make confessions it's the heart believes and makes confessions so you can do all the confessions and declaring you want Lamborghinis, million dollar houses, mansion you could try all the stuff but if you really don't believe that you know that you know with assurance that God's going to give you a million souls you're not going to have a million God's only obligated to do above what you can really get your faith then he meets you and does above and does a book beyond. And then he says have a bigger vision. Then he says have a bigger dream. Because you're thinking too small. You hear what I'm saying? Partnering and dreaming with God. Is an important key to becoming who God's called you to be. Because if you can't see it. And call forth those things that be not as though they were. If your spirit cannot project. And then you pull yourself into. And catch up. And if your dream doesn't get bigger. Where you could believe God. Like I'm struggling right now to believe God for a million souls in America. I'm really trying to get my faith around God give me a million. Because I'm struggling that I could even get 10,000 in a stadium let alone a million. You know, Because it was just a year ago I was doing Pakistan not America. And it's harder to believe God for stadiums in America. So I was like, God, are, are even we going to see a hundred saved? Like, I mean, and then others are like, Todd, you got Pakistan. Go over there. You get a million saved. I'm going to go to Pakistan. Don't worry. We're not done. But the Lord's been challenging me about, here my Lord send me to America. Give me the nation. Give me America. G give me stadiums in America. Give me a million in America. And I'm struggling because my faith, I don't know that I can really get a hold of the fact that a million are... Because I've been doing ministry so long about America, I haven't seen even 100,000 saved in America, collectively. So to be able to go a million souls in America is like a fresh, but yet I could say, give me a million in Pakistan, one meeting. Totally there in faith. I could go to Pakistan and have a million saved. It didn't even take any work. That's kind of where we got to in, in my faith. Okay? So, but America, it's like it starts all over again. It, some of you, your dream is just way too small for God to exceedingly abundantly above. Oh, wow. So if you lift your vision higher, then God is obligated to do above and beyond what you can think and dream. All right. All right. So that's why dreaming with God is an important key. And the dreams go up. And as you begin to see breakthrough. And God goes, look how easy that is. You asked me for a million at 22. Well, I gave you a million souls at 29. What are you going to do now? How about believe me for a million in a meeting? I was like, you want me to believe God for a million in one meeting? He goes, yeah, that's kind of the new standard of normal now. And raising the dead, the new standard of normal now is you got 37 resurrections from the dead. So you need to believe for 40. 
never believing I'd see one, let alone the new standard being dozens raised from the dead. You see what I mean? It just kind of increases as you know God, as you walk with God. But some of you just kind of stuck and limited and so small, you can't even believe God for a mission to Mexico or your internship or your ministry school fees. Sometimes God puts you in situations where he forces you to depend upon him and learn things about how faith works just so you can be in the pressure so he can supply, so your faith can grow. People that always come to my ministry and go, can we have your stuff for free? Can we have your scholarship for free? Can you just give it all away for free? Have no value, and they learn nothing about faith. People email my ministry all the time. Hey, Todd said he needs a team in Mexico. I'll go, and then we email them back, and we go, it's $1,500. They're like, oh, we thought Todd was paying for it. I was like, really? i got to pay my own way, raise my own money, and then you want me to pay for you. Where's your faith in the process? See, I'm just making practical examples of how ridiculous we get at times where we just tend to think that everything we should get in life should be a free handout. When God actually goes, no, you know what? I want you to create a GoFundMe, set a goal, and work your butt off to make it work. Because if you're ever going to be in ministry and you, and you don't know how to go about resources and find it, you're never going to be in a place where you can believe God for millions if you can't believe God for hundreds. I believe God puts us in situations intentionally where you're up against a hard place and a pressure just so you can believe God not become dependent upon your paycheck every month or your money in the bank every month. Because when you are so dependent upon easy life and money and savings, guess what you don't have? Room for supernatural provision above and beyond what your current budget is. You think in terms of payday. You think in terms of saving. You think in terms of investments. You think in terms of your portfolio. Not that those things are wrong, but you know what you don't depend upon God for? The ravens to bring you meat. The goldfish to give you two gold coins. God to provide out of nowhere a million dollars. Because you're so dependent upon the house and the inheritance and the say. Listen, those things are great within themselves, but they, they take away, in America especially, the need to have to be dependent upon God and be desperate to see God move like in Africa or in India, where it's either I get healed or die. We don't have Obamacare or Medicare or any care. We, we are blessed, and in our blessing we become without needing God supernaturally. Learning to have both is key. How to believe and call in the supernatural things, even when you have need of nothing. You know what the Lord told me one time? He said, do you have need of money right now? And I said, no, I'm doing pretty good. He goes, but when you're broke, you fast and, you, man, you, you scream and you jump up and down. And he goes, so what if you didn't have all that money, you know, in the bank, which I'm talking about the past. Don't get the idea that I'm sitting on all this money. But you know what the Lord said to me? You know what the Lord said to me, though? He said this to me. He goes, I'm glad that you have all that money. I'm glad you got that 20000 in your sock drawer or whatever it was back then. You know what he said? He goes, but what I don't like is you don't pray for provision the way that you did when you didn't have that money. I gave you a blessing. I gave you money. I gave you a job. But I still want you to believe for above and beyond because I don't want you to live by the natural means. You've lost your dependency for the supernatural because you become so comfortable but if I took away that job, I took away that money, I took away that health, allowed these things to happen in your life, man, when, when things get shaken, but you shouldn't have to wait to Easter or 9-11 or a shooting. God doesn't want to send these judgments. Don't get the idea God wants to send these judgments, but he'll use things to get our attention. And there's things about our life all the time that gets ease and it's no longer dependent. The challenge is in the midst of God's blessing is to be dependent upon. He still wants to say, give me my daily bread. You need to believe God as blessed as you are. No money, content, millionaire. You should still be believing God to provide for things he's called you to supernaturally because it's healthy for you to believe and live by faith. This is why I don't just give for free everything. I'm like, no, work for it. Learn how to do it yourself. Learn the business of ministry. Same way I have to fundraise for Mexico, you do. Except for I need a lot more money. I've got to pay for two stadiums. Why would we get the idea that Todd said he needs a team, I'll go, but I don't want to put anything in it? Well, I don't have anything to go. Well, you haven't even attempted. Some of you, God's trying to put in places of intention. Because he's trying to get you in places of faith for breakthrough.
so that you don't stay stuck. That's a practical apostolic fatherly type word about how faith works, how God breaks it down. And I'll tell you, I was in a place one time where I didn't have any money. I said to Heidi Baker, I was coming to Africa, a million dollars. Had to buy a five-ton truck, build two orphanages, feed 400,000 people, do a crusade in Mozambique and Malawi, and bring 120 people with me, and the whole budget was a million dollars. And I was supposed to make the commitment the next day, and I didn't have $4,000. And I thought, I don't want to turn down an opportunity to work with Iris Ministries and go to Africa and do all the great stuff we're going to do. So I don't have any money, God. And he said, no, but I do. And I said, well, God, what, what good is the money that you have that I don't? And I took an offering, and I remember the offering was so disappointing. It was like 2,000. I was like trying to get a million, you know. The offering was pretty. And I gave it away, Don Potter, Bobby Connor, somebody was preaching for me. And I said, well, I'm broke, and I'm not, that's not going to meet. So hallelujah, right? Well, the next day, a business guy calls me out of the blue. And I pick up my phone and go, hey. He goes, hey, Todd. My name's Jim. I'm out here in Oregon. I said, yeah. He goes, you still need a million dollars? I said, yeah. He goes, okay, I got a group of business guys. We're committing right now the million, so just know it's done. Click. A million dollars. Like, you can't even get your head. At 24, 5, 25 years old, I was gifted a million dollars for a mission, for a mission, a million dollars. And the whole thing was paid. <laughs> Hundreds of thousands reached with the gospel, fed 400,000 people, built two orphanages, brought Heidi Baker a truck, took 120 people to Africa with me. They made a movie called The Finger of God on one of our crusades in Malawi. And Jesus was walking through the crowds. You know, and uh, all this stuff happened. The guy drew the eyeball that had no eyeball. My bus driver grew an eyeball. There was no eyeball. He grew it right in. All these crazy miracles. Uh, because I believed God and even gave up in the end. It was like, oh, God, I just. <sighs> and then God in his love and grace was like, you still need that million? What do you believe in God for? What's the limitation? We're going to pray over people today, the seer gift. I'm going to pray at the altars. Here's one thing I'm going to do right now before I pray for anybody because I believe it's right to do it. I'm going to do it. And I don't usually do this myself, but most of my team and staff were like, hey, Todd, we're, we're out. We're, we're sick or burned out or tired, don't have anything else. Darren's been in bed for a week. And pray for him. Wes is battling. He said, pray for me. I got a birthday party today for Paris. She's three. I feel great. <laughs> But it's left me in this place. It's left me in the place as we finish the event here uh, that I, I'm going to receive an offering. But this offering is for, for the honorarium. For I'm taking an offering for, for me. I never usually take an offering for myself. So we're going to receive an offering in just a moment for those that would like to sow. Could we give everything else?